Yo, yo, yo. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Best Practices Show. My name is Kirk Barrett, where our goal is to make you better as a dentist. Our commitment is to find the best practices from the best practices or the best thinkers out there in dentistry and bring them to you so that you can create a better practice and a better life every day. So you can count on that from us. And today, I've got a great episode for you from a good friend of mine, Dennis Hartley, who lives right around the corner from me. And we don't get together that often, only because he's out speaking and running around. He's a great speaker, great influencer. And today we talk about safe and reversible techniques for the worn dentition, which is a crazy important topic, which if you've been paying attention to what's going on in dentistry, it's, it's one of the most important topics. And he presents some fantastic thinking today that will just make your life better. So make sure you check it out. He also talks about his educational process and why it's a little bit different. So you're going to want to see that also. So hope you enjoy the episode. We'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Best Practices Show. My name is Kirk Barron, and I'm the host here, and I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm having a lot of fun here, and today I've got a great episode with a friend of mine, Dennis Hartley, who, it's hard to nail him down, because the guy is a great influencer in dentistry, and he's on the go, and occasionally our paths cross, and we live like pretty close to each other. So uh, we were at a meeting a couple a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, we got to get together. So here we are today, and we're going to be talking about a very important subject, which we haven't done any we haven't done any shows on this, but the worn dentition. It's one of the hottest topics in dentistry, and if you're a dentist, you already know this is a huge challenge. If you can see the problem correctly, you can understand it and come up with some safe and you know safe thought processes, techniques around how to treat this, uh, you're going to be okay. And so today we're going to be talking about those exactly on this podcast. And before I do that, I just want to say this. Hey, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, This has been an interesting journey through COVID, post-COVID, and even as we get into 2022. Thank you guys for all the shares, the likes, suggestions, and the podcast is growing. I actually don't even know how or why, but keep sharing it with your friends and then keep giving us a review if you want to. If you enjoy today, just go there and give a review because it helps us find other like-minded dentists. And I also want to do a shout out to the dental schools because the dental schools have done a marvelous job, whether it be University of North Carolina, Marquette, all of you guys, thank you so much. It's so fun to talk to all these young dentists. I freaking love it. And so if you're a young dentist or a a wannabe dentist, or you're in the process of becoming a dentist, just I want to welcome you to a very safe, fun community where we're going to continuously bring value all the time and great thinkers. And today is no exception. I've got Dennis on. So Dennis, thank you for being on, brother. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Kirk. And the reason why it's so successful is because you do such a great job. I, I very much enjoyed listening to your interviews. I think you do a great job with uh, best practices and act and everything. So thank you for having me. This is awesome. Hey, it's my pleasure. I, You know, the cool thing about this show is you don't really have to know everything. I just surround myself. You guys, if you're listening, here's the secret to life. Spend your life surrounding yourself with people like Dennis, like Bob Marges, great team members. It, it just makes your life easy. You don't have to know anything. You just have to be around people that know stuff. And, and Dennis, I want people to know your, like who you are. This is a really hot topic. Very important. I want people to know, we're going to talk about your online learning, which was one of the first and why it's so different. But I want people to know who Dennis Hartley is before we start talking about this subject. So who are you? All right. Well, Kirk, I think it's easy. I I was a super, super average dental student. I uh, graduated from University of Michigan back in 1988. So I've been doing this for 30 some years now. Uh, What what was good about being an average student was that I had to work harder than my classmates to be decent at dentistry. And it's it's been a real advantage for me is that 
I was the person in the lab at night that was re-prepping teeth and re-prepping teeth and re-prepping teeth because it didn't come easy to me and it wasn't natural to me. Um, I probably should have spent more time studying and hitting the books, but I really loved doing the clinical stuff, but it didn't come easy and I worked really, really hard. Um, as, as I've talked to other people, I've probably prepped more plastic teeth than I have human teeth and I've been doing this for 30 some years. Um, but as they say in football, you know, to get ready for Sunday, it's all about Monday through Saturday. And I think in dentistry, it's not just about the days that you're seeing the patients, it's the days you're, you're not seeing the patients and how you're getting your skills better. Yeah. And so I think I, I was just lucky not to be super, super skilled like some of my classmates. I had to work extra, extra hard. And that's why I think I just enjoy the dentistry so much that I get to do. Okay, so 1988, yeah. you were at Michigan. So you guys won the national championship this year, that year. Michigan, I think they shared it with Notre Dame that year. I, I can't remember. I graduated from high school in 88. So, um, well, 97, 97, we grad, we, uh, won the football national championship Okay, and basketball. We won in 89 with Ramil Robinson when we fired our coach and stuff. So right oh. after that, okay, but I was so, right around that. <laughs> so again, I'll screw everything up, but you don't, you don't want to take any data from okay. me, but like, so where did you go after 88? So did you start in private practice? Give us a little hint on your, I'm so curious. Where did you go after dental so school? So when I, when I left, so I'm from Detroit area and back in the eighties, anyone from Detroit knows that. In the 80s, Detroit was going through a huge recession. Mm -hmm. um, there was upwards of 20% unemployment. Um, it didn't matter if you worked directly with the auto, auto industry, even indirectly, everybody was affected. And so I wanted to go into a community where it was more financially diverse, you know, more industry. So I moved to Chicago okay. and I did a general practice residency because I had no idea what I wanted to do. I wasn't clear on what I wanted to do in dentistry. I needed a year to hide and someone to pay me to do it. So. I did a one-year GPR at Mount Sinai Hospital in the city of Chicago and uh, just fell in love with the city and just love uh, being in Chicago. So that's how I moved to Chicago out of Detroit or out of Ann Arbor. Yeah, and you currently practice in Chicago. Um, we're in North, I don't even North know. suburbs. Yeah, I'm in the North suburbs, about 25 miles, just north of the city. So I practiced in the city for about 10 years and then moved up to the North suburbs. Uh, in the sort of mid-late 90s, I joined a guy named Dr. Buddy Mopper. Uh, who was a uh, cosmetic dentist. He's uh, Dr. Bond. If anyone wants to know about bonding, uh, yeah. Buddy will talk to you all night long about bonding. Um, so I ended up joining Buddy's practice in the mid to late 90s. And then I ended up in the suburbs from there on. See, I, I, I've already learned. So I did not there know you, you were with Buddy Mopper. That's I sure pretty cool. was, yeah. That yeah, was... we were partners for 20 years together before he retired. Okay, so if I'm a young dentist listening, how important was that about your journey watching somebody yeah. like Buddy work? You know, it's, it's so interesting. Uh, mentorship, I think, is the key to dentistry. It's key to, it's, it's key to everything in life, but especially in dentistry, because of the skill set that we need, the techniques that we need to learn, it's so difficult to learn them just haphazardly. And so you can go through like Spear or Coyce or Dawson or Panky. That's, those are opportunities for mentorship. And I think with DOT, we do the same thing. But the, the chance to, to be with a person who was one of the first five cosmetic dentists in the country, maybe in the world, and understand their thinking and their thought process and learn from their mistakes. And I think that's such a huge thing, yeah. learning from their mistakes. And not that you're not going to make the same ones. If you're as hard-headed as I am, you're going to make the same mistakes. But you will remember that they said, ah, don't do this. And now you'll say, oh, well, that's why they said not to do it. Yeah. And so um, I think mentorship is absolutely critical in our profession. And yeah. it's so, so important. Okay, so I got to ask this. Give me one of your favorite buddyisms, like something, <laughs> like something you like he taught you that you're like, ooh, this helped me rethink about this. Well, I mean, there's so many things. So if you haven't seen Dr. Mopper lecture, you ought to you ought to do it because he's he's one of a kind. He has very colorful language, and I'll I'll tell a story. I hope he's not embarrassed if he hears this, but. He, he was lecturing in Philadelphia to the uh, Aesthetic Academy, the AED, and he's up on the dais and his presentation is on diastema closure. And he stands up there and he leans over the, the podium and he points out to the audience, he says, all you guys who are out there prepping teeth for veneers to close diastemas, you ought to be put in jail. <laughs> That's so that got everybody's attention. And the, the reality is, is that he, he he has he has led a way on how to be very conservative with dentistry, mm -hmm. how not to have to 
you know, reduced tooth structure to close diasmas, how to be additive instead of removing tooth structure and destroying tooth, tooth health. So, um, so many things I learned from him, but really one of the biggest things that I learned when I started with Buddy, I had been taking a lot of hands-on courses uh, with porcelain. Mm -hmm. So I was with a lot of lab technicians taking how to build up porcelain, how to layer and stack porcelain like we did in the days. And I was awful at composites. I was terrible. I mean, I was really, really awful. They didn't last, they broke, they stained, they looked bad. I was just terrible. And you still hear it today, but even more so back then, people would say that, well, composite is just a good temporary material. And they wouldn't even say that. They wouldn't say it was a good temporary material. They would just say it's, a, it's an okay temporary material. And when I sat down with Mopper and we had dinner one night before I joined the practice, and I told him, I said, I'm no good at it and I don't have any confidence in it. And he said, well, come in and watch what I do and see what you think. And this was a defining moment for me in my life, quite honestly, beyond my practice, because I was young and I thought I knew it all. And this really helped me understand how little I really knew. I was observing him do the dentistry and it blew me away. I just couldn't believe it. But what, just, what completely changed my world was I went to watch him do a hygiene exam. And I'm over his shoulder, he's doing the hygiene exam, and I'm holding up his chart notes and his handwriting is just like chicken scratch. I can't read anything. And he's saying the teeth or I'm looking at that and the teeth look completely natural. And he's talking about the bonding that he did on the teeth. He did this on number seven, he did this on number nine, he did this on number 10, whatever. And he hadn't done all the teeth. It was like, you know, an MIFL, it was a space closure, it was this and that, I couldn't even see it. I couldn't even see what he had done. Wow. And that's, that was it for me. That's exactly what I said. I said, wow, this is, this is shown me how being so set in my thoughts has really kept me from really learning. And it, then that just sort of opened up doors for me that, you know, there's so much out there and you just can't believe the dogma um, that some people might be saying. You just have to be open and see how different approaches can affect you in a, you know, in a positive way in your, in your dental world and in your, in your personal life. Yeah, I'm loving this. I have so many questions for you already. You know, buddy said, you said he said that in Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. So, um, it's interesting because that's like, that's the one place you can get eaten alive by saying anything. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. that's pretty interesting. And he, and he did that. I mean, Kois is in the room, Spears in the room. Wow. I mean, every, every big name dentist is in that audience. And, you know, he, he has a way of just saying what's on his mind, um, which yeah. is, you know, if you're been around buddy, it can be very graphic. So it's, yeah. it's kind of fun. Yeah, and I want to go back to something else that you said, too. You talk about conservative uh, dentistry, and if you're a young dentist, I want you to hear this because, Dennis, you and I share a, a bunch of mutual great friends. One of them is Bob Marges, sure. and Bob and I talk about this all the time. He says, he says this very passionately. We should have a tooth preservation fee. You know, in the old days, you used to get paid for really trimming down tooth structure, and dentists really now have to think better. Like, remember, patients are paying for a result. They're not weighing how much tooth dust right. is, 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 is like up in the air by the end of the appointment to adjust a feed. Give me some perspective on your thought of that. If I'm a young dentist looking at a future in dentistry. Yeah, so true. I think those are great words. Uh, Corky Wilhite, who's one of the best bonded bond composite dentists out there. Um, Corky talked about veneering for porcelain versus composite and very often with composite veneers, we don't have to do tooth removal to get really beautiful results. And, and I had asked him about his fees, and he said the same thing. And this is 20 years ago, Kirk. And he said, yeah, I should be charging my patients more because I don't have to remove their tooth structure. And that should be of more value to my patients than when I have to remove their tooth structure to do porcelain. And so certainly there's some great dentists. Uh, Dennis Wells does some great, um, you know, non or very conservative, no prep veneers. I find that really challenging with porcelain. Uh, but tooth conservation is, is what it's all about today. And as long as I have found, as long as I'm upfront with my patients and I say, look, here's, here's your two options. Say we're talking about veneering, for instance. You, you have two options. We can do this in porcelain. And here's the advantages and disadvantages of porcelain. Advantage of porcelain, it's super strong, very durable. It's not likely to chip. You're going to get many, many years out of it. But here's the disadvantage. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to drill down your tooth structure. I have to take an impression. The impression goes to the lab. You're going to have to wait about a month to get the um, veneer back from the lab. I'll try it in. It's not likely going to match the first time. I'll send it back to the lab. We'll see a month after that. Hopefully it matches then, but it might be a third or fourth time. Mm 
Um, the alternative is composite. With composite, here's how it goes. There's typically less drilling. It's done immediately. It's all done in one visit. You know, and so I allow the patient to make the decision that's right for them. Some patients, it's all about durability. Give me the strongest material. I want something that's going to last the longest. I don't want to worry about it. I travel a ton. That's fine. Porcelain's yeah. the answer. Other patients are like, don't drill my tooth. Yeah. I, I don't want you to touch my tooth. If you can minimize how much you drill the tooth, then I will, I will own the fact that there's going to be more maintenance with a composite veneer than what there will be with porcelain veneers. I think the key for dentists is to have both skill sets so that you can allow the patient to make the determination and not you choose. Yeah. And I tell you, it's really rewarding because um, when patients have made the choice, then they own that choice for better or for worse. Love and it. I will have patients that I've done composite veneers on and they've had some chipping and stuff. And I'll say, you know, do you want to go to porcelain? And they're like, if it means you got to drill down my tooth, let's just redo the, the bonding. Okay, yeah. let's do Let's redo the bonding. That's your, that's great. I love it. I hope you guys are listening and taking notes on this because that is spot on. I freaking love it. Now, I want to talk about the why of worn dentition. Let me just add this. Like, so I've been doing this for 25 years. I can't remember where I was, but it was somewhere. And Spear was doing this I don't know, big summit. And I remember the, the door said, the, you know, the worn dentition. My first thought was, now this is a long time ago. This is 15 years yeah. ago. I remember there, there's going to be four people in that room. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, like with everything that was going on in the world, I'm like, right. how the heck can there? And I opened the doors. I walked in. There was like 300 dentists in the room and they couldn't even find seats for people. I'm like, whoa. And I asked the guy and the guy that was like getting us all, he's like, you got to understand, like, this is one of the hottest topics ever. And so let's talk about the why. Why is this such an important subject, Dennis, in dentistry, the worn dentition? Well, in my opinion, I think people who are listening or viewing, they, they know it. They see it every day. And the challenge, I think, Kirk, is, you know, when you're looking at these patients in worn dentition, very often what's happened happens in my practice, as much as I, I, I hate to admit it, you'll have patients that's been a long-standing patient in your practice, and you're just very slowly watching their teeth just wear away. And you don't know what to do. You don't know how to intervene. Uh, it's certainly not something that we're taught in dental school. And the only intervention techniques that we are taught are like full mouth reconstructions. And so you imagine you have a patient who comes in as a new patient, they got worn down teeth, and your first comment's going to be to them, you know, you, I need to drill every single tooth in your mouth. Well, as dentists, we know that's not a real big seller, seller right? This is a good way to chase people out of your practice. Um, what I have learned to do through the hard way, and if anyone has gone through this, I, I'm not alone. Um, there's, there's the people that you've treated in your practice that you wish you had never started. And unfortunately, where you figure this out is when you're in the provisional phase, when you're in the temporaries. Right. This is when you realize, like, dang, what I just get myself into, right? And I had this woman, this is about 20 years ago. I was doing a reconstruction. It was supposed to be upper lower reconstruction. I needed to open the vertical. I needed to open, I needed to work both arches to manage the case. I started on the upper arch, put in provisionals. She came back and she said, I'm not going to do the lowers. I said, well, you need to do the lowers for this. This is like a car. It's got four tires. We just did the front tires. Now we got to do the rear. We can't just do. And she refused. And so we just did the upper uh, reconstruction. It was not good. It was uh, the, the quality of the occlusion was horrible. I couldn't manage the aesthetics the way I wanted to. Functionally, it was awful because I was only working on one arch when both arches were, were destructive. And then I had been teaching with Corky Wilhite at the time. And Corky had talked to me about a case he had just done where he had just used bonding to open up somebody's bite. And I said, Corky, this is, this is brilliant. You got to start teaching this. And the very next case, I, it was a worn dentition case when, um, and the patient came in and I said, you know what, we're going to be a little safer with this. And instead of start prepping your teeth, we're going to do this in a more reversible, a safe way. So that if you are the patient that I say, I wish I hadn't treated, I can literally take off the bonding, write you a check, give you your money back, and send you on your merry way. And I've, I've done that a couple of times in my practice where I've literally taken off the bonding and said, you know what, it's not, this isn't working between us, and, uh, and it's been great. And it's uh, saved me a bunch of headaches from patients who otherwise would have caused me a lot of stress, and same for my practice and my team members and stuff. Yeah, and I want to go a layer deeper on this, you know, because the whole topic is safe and reversible. And so if I'm a young dentist, now take us through the evolution of self-awareness as a dentist. Because when you get out, 
Like you can fix everything. You can right. help everybody, but it's not so much the dental condition. Some of these patients are legitimately like, you're like, oh. whoa. And we refer to them as damaging dollars. Sometimes they're dollars. You're better off not collecting, but you don't, you, I, you, you could sit and lecture young dentists about this, but you have to experience it before you know, okay, I just spent a lot of stomach lining trying to treat this patient. What was, what would you say to that? Or what was kind of some big learning for you when you talk about safe and reversible ways to treat worn dentition? Well, I, you're absolutely right. There, there are so many patients that we treat, especially as you start doing more and more complex dentistry, comprehensive dentistry and cosmetic dentistry, you're going to attract a population that's going to be more demanding. And some of those patients, most of the patients are awesome. And most of the patients are super great and super appreciative and they're great to work with, but there's going to be some that aren't awesome. And uh, the problem isn't uh, below the nose, it's, uh, it's above the nose. And right. the, what their perception is and what reality is can be very, very different. Uh, as, as a point, uh, two days ago, um, we, I would tell you that we take photos of every tooth that we do for aesthetics. And I would tell you, we almost always do. And it came and bit me right in, can, right in the butt. So I'm working on a adult daughter of a periodontist who I'm doing some posterior restorations. She says, you know, I got a little chip on the, on the edge of uh, tooth number nine. Could you smooth that off for me? And we always take photos. We didn't take a photo. Mm -hmm. And so I usually, I literally just use some polishing discs. Some of the fine polishing discs just smoothed off the edge, right? Um, I get an e a text message from the dentist saying she's hysterical on how I damaged her tooth. And I literally spent 15, 20 seconds just with some polishing discs, just smooth, just ro rolling on a sharp edge. And we didn't take photos. It's all on me. I didn't take the photos. And, um, you know, I just got a text a little while ago that she's, she's convinced that I've destroyed her tooth. Wow. And I literally spent 15, 20 seconds just using some sandpaper discs just to smooth off a, a corner. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's real and it happens. And so, um, well, I have learned, and I think all of us who've done dentistry for longer than a week, that you're going to run into patients that what they perceive and what you're seeing is just going to be completely different. And I told my dental assistant, she said, you didn't do anything. You didn't even, you hardly touched the tooth. I said, I know that's, that's, that's what we saw, but that's not her perception. Yeah. So I think the more we can do minimally invasive, reversible dentistry, the safer we are, the healthier we'll be mentally in our career, and the, the more we'll be able to enjoy our career. Yeah, the moving target, like that's one of them is like the problem. I love that. I'm going to borrow that. The problem isn't below the nose. It's above the nose. I've never heard that before. I'm using... The other thing is, is that you've seen this. So how long you've been doing dentistry? How... So this would be how many years? 33. Yeah, 33. 33 talk, ab talk about what you've seen in the materials. Now, when you talk about opening up the bite with the material, the materials have come a long way. And it's any, you get to be the insider on some of these conversations. It's anyone's guess what these materials are going to look like in the next couple of years. But the, these materials have come a long way from what they used to be, right? Well, yes and no. I think you, we look back and I got out in 88. And then in the late 80s, early 90s is when the first micro hybrids came out. Mm -hmm. And so we had hybrids, which were larger than one, um, one micron particle size, not that that's important, other than those materials you sustain quite a bit, but they were super, super strong, super durable. So back in the day, we would use these large particle materials where we needed them for strength, but because they polish so poorly and they stain so much, we would surface them with a microfill, which would give us better polish and better aesthetics. But those don't have the same strength, flexural strength especially. So in the late 80s, they came out with these micro hybrids, which was supposed to be the best of both worlds. You get the same strength as a hybrid, but you get the polishability of a microfill. Well, we use these materials and we learned, well, it's not really true. They polish better than the micro hybrids, but they didn't maintain a polish like a microfill did. And so for two decades, we used these micro hybrids for our posterior restorations. And for anteriors, we'd either use micro hybrid or we would layer them with microfill. And then in the 90s, we came out with our nanofill materials, our nanofills and our nanohybrids. And it was the same conversation that the nanofills would then replace our microhybrids and our microfills, that they are as strong as our microhybrids, which they actually are not. They're about 10 to 15% weaker than our microhybrids, and that they polish and maintain their polish as well as the microfills. And actually, they don't maintain their polish as well as the microfill. So these nanofills and nanohybrids are great materials. They're universal materials. They're nice and strong. They polish nicely. They're good universal material. But the reality is um, I still use my microhybrids. 
if I'm looking for the ultimate strength, if I'm dealing with someone who's a bruxer, bruxer if I'm dealing with someone who has, or I'm going to open vertical dimension and I need more strength of material, um, I might pull out my micro hybrid. Um, if I need a universal material, then I can use my nano, nano materials, my nano fields, and my nano hybrids. But I think we've had the materials, we've had the ability to bond to enamel for 50 years, with 60 years with Unicor's work, um, and our ability to bond to dentin over the last 10 to 15 years, since we've started to understand that better, we really have great materials and great opportunities to really have very successful restorations, not like what we talked about 20 years ago. I think we're, we're, in a, we're in a really great position with the materials and with the adhesives that we have and our understanding of how to use them in our, in our practices. Yeah, and I'm loving this. Now, I want you to just go a layer deeper on the why behind the safe and reversible. So if I'm a young dentist, and here's one of the questions I might just layer in there is like, what do young dentists or maybe even you got wrong early trying to understand worn dentition? you know, and how to be And let me put one more layer in here because we're going to layer yeah. porcelain probably. Um, people are going to be living longer in the mm -hmm. future, you know, like, yep. and I think it's okay to say, look, everything we create is temporary in some respect, you know, Correct. and also managing forces. Wait, Dr. Harley, I'm not a Bruxer. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, you, right. hear, you hear that yep. all day long. All the time. I don't okay. my teeth. So I don't even know if that's a question, but can you just add your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think the why, I think there's a couple things. I, you, you ask a great question. The, the why, number one, is when, when you don't do reversible treatment, when you, do, when you, when you put a burr on a tooth, um, the patient kind of owns you. And it's, it's very expensive when things go poorly, not only financially, but it's really devastating to the practice, emotionally for the staff. This is the person who's on the schedule that you just don't want to see. Um, they're the ones that, are, that make, make our world so much, so much harder and so much more challenging. So part of the why is just to reduce the emotional and the financial costs of treating patients and the unpredictability of what patient, which patients are going to be problematic as far as being able to get them happy with the aesthetics, but also with the function, right, with the occlusion. And the second part of the why and why would we do this in a transitional phase, um, what I call prototypes, is because not everyone's occlusion is the same. The way people function and their eccentric movements, they're all different. They're like snowflakes. And trying to understand each person's patterns, you know, you can do that in provisional restorations, um, but they're, you've already drilled the tooth and you are committed to the treatment. And that can be fine. Um, but it can also be kind of scary. And so I like the opportunity of making, reducing the opportunity for conflict and reducing the opportunity for surprises by doing something that's in a transition phase that's reversible so that both the patient and I can excuse ourselves from our relationship if we, if we decide to. Yeah. So, and then uh, something you said earlier, I want to go back to that too, is you know, once you start getting good at something, people start to seek you out for this, yeah. which means they have higher expectations. Some dentists think, oh, I'll just charge higher fees. This will be easier. No higher fee, higher expectation. And then you and I also share a friend, Jim McKee, who treats TMD, TMJ, and everyone goes, no, those are crazy patients. And Jim's like, no, they come. Like, I don't even think Jim's a dentist because I can't find him on the internet. He doesn't even have a website. <laughs> He's crazy busy coming, you know, with patient after right. patient. He's like, no, these people have problems. He's learned that the better you get it, that the more you get, and you just have to be ready for these. These patients that come to you now, Dennis, they have high expectations. So the the whole idea of let's let's get to know each other first, make sure expectations are being managed before we do definitive dentistry, that works for you right now in your career, right? Absolutely. And I'd say for the young dentist, and I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. And so, you know, I was out a dozen years when I started doing this. It allows a young dentist to be able to um, get a better understanding of the patient's function, of the patient's aesthetic needs and desires. You know, we're, the, the problem I think that we have in dentistry is that, and this is, this is a real challenge with some of our laboratory technicians. They have in their mind what they think the aesthetics of a case should be like. Well, that may not be what our patients want. That's, I think, one of the beauties of direct resin bonding is that I can change the contour of my bonding if the patient's not happy. You want larger embrasures? We're going to open up the embrasures. You want the line angles moved over? I can do that. And I have more control with direct resin bonding. Um, even, even with having wonderful ceramics, 
and I can give them a study guide or I can give a scan of what the provisionals look like, very often the technician is going to alter that design somewhat. And so then the patient's going to come back with veneers or crowns that aren't quite like what the provisionals were like. Sometimes that's positive, sometimes that's a good thing, but very often patients are used to the provisionals, the shape, the length, the contour, and when they get something different, it can be a real, um, it can be a real challenge. So I think going through a transition phase helps the dentist be able to understand what the patient is looking for so they can be more direct with the ceramics when they're doing the work. This is what we need. This is how it has to be shaped. Follow this contour. This is critical for this patient. Um, and I think that's important for the success because ultimately our practices are built by one case at a time. Our reputation is built one case at a time. And that's, that's, how, that's how I've been able to build my practice. Yeah. And, then, you know, the worn dentition, I think that's a moving target too. Like we don't know everything there is to know about worn dentition yet. And so what do you think most dentists get wrong when they're, you know, because I just love layering this with you because I've heard this said, there's so many treatment plans but there's really only one diagnosis. But a lot of times people can't even agree on the diagnosis of that. So what do most dentists get wrong about worn dentition from your perspective? Um, it's a great quote from Maury Amsterdam. He said there can be uh, multiple treatment plans, but there's one true diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what makes it challenging, Kirk, and especially for the young dentists, there's so much to learn. And you brought up Jim McKee, who's a really, really good friend of mine. And Jim is an expert on TMJ, and then someone I think you've probably had on, Jeff Rouse, who's an expert on airway. And so when we're looking at worn dentition, the question I have is, is there a joint relationship to this? What's going on in the joints? Is that relating to what's going on in the occlusal wear? Um, if it is, that's okay. We just have to understand it. Um, is there an airway issue with this? Is this someone that we need to talk, be talking about airway issues? Do we need to screen them for airway? We do that in our practice. We use a high-res pulse oximeter. We'll send them out for airway um, evaluation, nasal obstruction. Um, do they need to be on CPAP? Do we have to talk about other, you know, do we have to talk about surgeries and stuff? So I think that one of the challenges for me when I was going through this is that, all right, I need to learn about joints. I got to learn about airway. And then I have to learn how to do the dentistry, which in itself is just super, you know, super challenging and complicated. So I think I, I don't want to overwhelm um, when we're talking, but there are, there are some basics we got to know. Is, are the joints healthy? What are we doing with the joints? Is there an airway disturbance issue? Is this going to need to be managed? And if so, that's a bigger issue, quite honestly, than worn down teeth. If someone is not breathing at night, if someone is suffocating while they're sleeping, that's a way bigger issue than their teeth are wearing down, right? And so just getting patients to understand that, hey, there may be something that's a bigger deal than your worn down teeth. Let's get that checked out. Um, I've had so many patients who have thanked me for just getting them in the hands of their um, sleep physician and getting them on CPAP or if we made them a dental appliance, whatever, um, to help them breathe when they're sleeping. Yeah. So I think learning that stuff is really critical. And then understanding that if you're going to be changing somebody's, if you're going to, if people have worn down teeth, question I always had was how much can I build up their bite? This is what I was always worried about, right? I'm like, can I add one millimeter of height? Can I add two millimeters? How much can I add? What I've learned is, is what I want to do is recreate tooth form. Sometimes to recreate tooth form, I have to open their vertical a couple millimeters. Sometimes to recreate tooth form, I have to open their vertical five, six, seven millimeters. So it's really about being able to create the proper tooth form so that we can create proper tooth contacts. So we, then we can get more ideal tooth disclusion when they're in function and get better tooth, uh, um, tooth approximation as they're chewing and all. Yeah, I love this. That was long-winded. No, no, I love it because uh, I'm going to fly right into the eye of the hurricane right here. Because if I'm a young dentist and I'm listening to this, I'm already overwhelmed. You know, you said you we're not going to try to make this overwhelming, yeah. but we are because I want to speak to the reality of this. And, I, you know, the industry is diametrically opposed in this. You have experts now telling young dentists, you can grow your practice. Just get good at everything. Like do endo, do this, do the place your implants. So I hear you're an artist, Dennis. Like you're you're obviously passionate. You've become good at this few things. But like you're not like, yeah, I'll do the TMD and I'll you know place and restore my own implants. I can do ortho too. I you know, and I'm kind of I'm being a little facetious here, but what would you say to a young dentist? 
and it's everyone has an opinion for a long career in dentistry. Like some of these people are at a crossroad. Like, do I do airway? Cause I've seen this. I have young dentists that are like getting all into airway and yep. they're trying to do aesthetics too. Yep. And they're trying to do the whole inflammation thing. And they're trying to place and restore their own implants. Where do we find meaning in all this? Yeah, and I get it. You know, the pressures on the young dentists today with the debt they have coming out of school. Right. I mean, I had significant debt, but it's nothing like what's coming out today, right? And, and I understand that and, and want to be sensitive to that. Um, so I can understand why people want to do their own endo, why they want to place their own implants, why they want to do their own Invisalign and ortho, because those are big money procedures that they can take, you know, not a lot of time. When you start getting into pros cases, those are going to take more time. They do, you know, and that's more more time, not just treating the patient, but after hours patient, you know, you know, if you're mounting up your own cases or if you're doing digital design and you're you're, and you're collaborating with your lab technician, that all takes a lot of time. Um, you know, I can only speak for my approach. I knew I was not good at a lot of stuff. It was easy for me to see. I was awful at endo. I mean, I was just, if I can't see it, I can't do it. You know, I mean, I thought it would look great. I take an x-ray, it's like, crap. It's again, short. How come every time I do an endo, it's short? And every time I do an endo, it's short. I suck at it. Um, I tried doing some ortho. I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't like ortho. Um, I don't like surgery. It wasn't, wasn't my, you know, it wasn't my cup of tea. I like being able to control aesthetics and I like being able to control people's occlusion. That's, that's what I enjoyed. Now, I have found in working with young dentists over the years that they start to figure out what they like. And I think you talk about this a lot in your podcasts. Figure out what you like and, and do it well. But I think if you try to do everything, um, I, I think I, there's just too much to learn. There's too much to do really, really well. How do you compete with your endodontist who's using a surgical microscope to do endo? How do you do endo to that level if you're not using a surgical microscope and don't have the same you know, materials and the skills and techniques? I suppose if you have all that stuff, that's great. But then how are you doing all the other stuff? I, 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 I don't know. I think it's so complicated. It's very complicated. I think you bring up a lot of good things. I, I mean, my journey is the same as yours. I, I suck at a lot of things. Like I'm only good at a few things. And I think the important piece, and let's be respectful to everybody's place in the journey. When you're young, you think you're good. I mean, I thought I oh, was yeah. good at a lot of things. And then self-awareness starts to creep in. I mean, one of my favorite videos of all time is Gary Vee's video to the USC School of Entrepreneurs, which I'm going to warn you, the language is extremely colorful, but the message is the best I've ever heard, which is he just, and I'll summarize the whole video. is like, if I had one piece of advice, I would take every test on the planet, find out, you know, who you are as fast as possible. It's called self-awareness and take all of your chips and put them all in mm -hmm. on the things that you enjoy and you're good at and you'll be fine. And I agree with that, but that's a hard message to understand when you're young because, um, and um, so that's one piece of it. And the other piece is, um, let's go back to the overwhelm piece. This is a lot. Education. Yeah. Now, there's two pieces to this. Dennis. I totally am picking up what you're putting down if I'm a young dentist. Now, I also want to talk about you ha you've, you've done something extremely unique in education. I'm thinking about all this if I'm a dentist. Like, this is great. But you got to understand, COVID happened. Like, we're not doing these. In you created a one-of-a-kind uh, virtual learning platform that's very different than just anyone else's. Can you speak about that? Because you're going to incorporate the doing and the learning in the same component, right? How, how did you yeah. do that? So first, I want to say that my learning was through Spear. Before there was a Spear Institute, I was out at Frank Spear's um, office, the first in-office class that Frank taught in Seattle. I was in a room with 10 other dentists sitting in an oval table in his uh, consultation room. Um, and I've taken a bunch of Spear stuff. I've taken uh, some McCoy stuff, though not, out, not at the Koi Center. Um, I've taken Dawson courses, and I have great friends who've, um, who are part of Panky and teach at Panky and have taken Panky. I think there's some excellent opportunities for in-person courses. Um, Cosmonet does great in-person courses for composites, right, and some porcelain stuff. But the downside with these in-person courses is that they are they're very expensive. You have to block out time out of the office, which then makes it even more. You're really doubling down, right? You're closing down your practice, plus you're paying a, a you know, significant amount of money for these courses. You have to fly somewhere typically. You got to stay overnight in hotels. You got to leave your family. There's a lot of sacrifices that people make to do these in-person courses. 
Uh, back in 2017, I had taught a course at Cosmonet, and we have 15 participants in the hands-on courses. And typically, and Kirk, I'm not sure if you, if you get this experience, but when you're doing a hands-on course, it's different than doing a lecture. When you do a lecture, you just give your presentation. And there's going to be people who are like totally, totally dialed in. You're going to have people who are on their cell phones, and they're going to be checking their emails, and they're going to be you know, doing whatever, checking the scores of the games and placing their bets for the, for the next game. When you're doing a hands-on workshop, people are all in, right? And you got everyone right in front of you. And typically, there's a bell curve when you're teaching a hands-on workshop. You got people who are really accelerated. They've already seen the information. They've been working with the materials. They're there to get some few more tips and just make their stuff better. You get the middle of the bell curve where people have some experience, and then you get the laggards, people who have really very little experience in this particular topic. And it's almost always like in a 15-person course, you'll have two or three. They're sitting in the very front row right in front of you. They're eager to go. They already know most of it. They could be teaching the course. You got people in the middle. And then the people in the very back row are the people who don't have much experience. This particular course I was teaching had three really accelerated people in the front row, and the rest didn't know how to open a uh, tube of composite. They, they were just sort of brand new to composites. They didn't know one end from the other. And so this is a super expensive course. And when we finished, it was, I couldn't teach fast enough for the three people who were super accelerated. And I couldn't teach slow enough in the hands-on workshop for the people who are really just learning it. And I was really frustrated and kind of depressed, to be quite honest, because I love teaching. I love sharing what others have taught me, what Buddy's taught me, and Corky, and Newton Fall, and Bob, and all these other people, what they've shared with me. And I was having a, having a beer with, a, with an IT buddy of mine, and I said, it's not they're stupid, it's just that they haven't been exposed to the information. If I could be in their office and show them how to do this slower at their pace, I know they get it, and I know they could learn this. And he said, well, why don't we do that? Let's set up something. And so that was the genesis of our dental online training where I said, you know what, instead of people spending all this money to go to these live workshops, we're going to create these live on, or virtual on-demand workshops where we'll have pre-recorded video, we'll have a lecture that will go over like how, class four composites, what do you need to know? And we go through all the salient information. We'll talk about uh, bevel techniques and etching and we'll talk about layering and all that stuff. And then after that, then we go into the hands-on and I film through a microscope and I send a kit to the participants and they have the same exact materials, the same composites, the same type of dot, the same burrs, the same polishers. And it's broken down into short little modules. So the modules may be three or four minutes. Okay, this is how I place the bevel. You have the same tooth model. Make your bevel that looks something like this. This is the concept. All right, you go ahead and do it. I'm going to meet you over at the next section. That's awesome. Next section starts and we do it step by step by step. People can upload photos of their cases. There's an interactive page so people can write in questions and get back and help them and sort of get them through all that. And so that, that was sort of the genesis of how I started dental online training. We do things like CPR for the worn dentition. How do you treat a worn dentition course? This is a really, um, this is a substantial course. I think it's maybe 12 hours of recorded time between the hands-on portion and the lecture portion. Um, but there's lots of valuable information from how do you do a class one composite? How do you do a class two composite? How do you do a flat, class five composite? How do you prep teeth for porcelain veneers? Um, on and on and on, all these restorative techniques to help dentists be able to learn in the comfort of their own practice without having to close down their practice and do it at, their, um, at the comfort of their style and their pace. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that you said at the beginning of the interview was, you know, you've done more on plastic than you've done on human teeth. And just talk about that journey. I mean, everyone's so hot on the digital. I think it's important that we just, we learn a lot on analog. I mean, I, I, I mean, and of course, I'm giving my opinion, but it's it's really good to pla to to work on plastic, right? I I think it's in, I I believe that if if you can be great at digital, my partner, Dr. Chris Ching, he's phenomenal with digital and using ExoCAD and doing digital design. He's doing some really cool stuff. But when when push comes to shove, when stuff gets into the mouth, it may look good digitally. It may look good on the screen. It may look good as he's designing it. He puts it in the mouth. Guess what? He's still got to shape it. You know, there's going to be times he looks at it and he says, you know what? I don't like the contour on this. I got to dial this back. The line angles are wrong on this. I got to bring in the contour. Um, if, if you don't have the hand skills, 
then you're going to be completely dependent on your lab technician for all your dentistry. And as much as, as talented as my lab technicians are, um, it's not infrequent when I have to go back and do some shaping and contouring to the ceramics just to blend it in better, to make it more form to the patient's face and to their smile. And I, I think it's absolutely critical to get good at doing things, um, hand contouring, so that you can do better for the, for the porcelain work that you do. Yeah, I love this. I'm going to have you back again and again and again and talk about the, the problems in dentistry. Any last thoughts you have on the future of the worn dentition or safe and removable thought processes? Yeah, I, doing this for so long, I can, I can tell everyone out there and those who've been doing this as long as I have, they know uh, that treating the wrong patient is just so, it's so exhausting and it takes so much out of, out of the practice. And if you can do things to minimize your risk, I think that you're better off. Um, through our prototype phase, our transitional bonding, making sure that we understand what the patient's uh, hopes and desires are, that we're able to manage their occlusion, that we're gonna have functional success before we move into the final definitive porcelain. Um, and I'll be honest, when I do transitional bonding or prototype bonding, it's the least stressful of my appointments because you know what, it doesn't have to be perfect. Wait, and you could still charge for that, right? And, and I charge a premium. And what I found was, and interesting you said that, because when I first started doing this, I undersold it because I thought, I'm going to do this transitional bonding, and then everyone's going to just pay me for the porcelain. And it turns out at least 30 to 40% of my patients I do transitional bonding on, they don't want to move to porcelain. Yeah. Because they say it looks great. You know yeah. what? I don't want you to drill down my teeth. This looks fine. You know what? And if it doesn't maintain, we'll redo it. Yeah. So I charge a premium for that. And you know what? It's, it is the least stressful procedure I do because I don't have to worry about all the polychromicity. I don't have to worry about the layering. I, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to satisfy the basic aesthetics. And if patients say, you know what? I wish it were this, that, or that, then I can say, well, it sounds like we need to transition into porcelain. Yeah, it's right? amazing. That's it's good. amazing, like, how you think and where this came from. And you remember... You know, Jimmy Eubanks used to do all these courses on layering oh, porcelain and the strength of it. And I awesome. think about you, you know, you're, you're doing, you're layering trust. At the end of the day, guys, if you're listening, people only do things because they trust and believe you're the person that can do this. And Dennis, what you're doing is you're just layering trust. It's not so much about the bonding and, you know, it's like, hey, listen, let's go into this together. Are we on the same page before we do the next phase? Would you agree with that? Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. It is all about trust. Yeah, you, you put that perfectly. Yeah, it's all about the trust and gaining people's trust. And some people, I think, come in inherently, they're going to trust you because you treated their cousin or you treated their sister-in-law and they're fine. Go ahead, doc. Whatever you got to do, just do it. I don't think that's a majority of patients. I think it's becoming less and less uh, in our Google-driven world, right? Everyone's got in sort of expertise as they walk in the door. And I find even at my stage of my practice, I still have to prove my abilities and my excellence because everyone has their thoughts on how the teeth should look and what, the, what their expectations are. Yeah, I think you're right on. Amen, brother. Hey, uh, so how do I, if I'm a dentist and I want to get involved in your online, you know, learning platform, which I'm going to highly encourage you guys to do. So how do I find this? Where do I go? Uh, so go to DOT, that's for Dental Online Training, dothandson.com. It's all one word, dothandson.com. Uh, we have a couple options. We have a monthly subscription for as our basic membership. I think it's like $49 a month. It gives you op um, access to all our videos. Uh, we also do webinars. Um, we have other things. We have blogs and stuff like that that, uh, that we do. Um, we also have some people who are helping us, like Jim McKee is doing some courses for us. And we have some others that are coming on and doing some courses for things that I don't have expertise on that I understand but don't have the expertise to teach. Um, and then if you want uh, full access to our live virtual courses, where we do four times a year, we do live virtual hands-on workshops. And we have other, we have mentorship. Um, we used to call it coffee and donuts. Essentially, it's a study club meeting. We meet one Friday a month uh, in the morning, and we just go through cases. And we talk about stuff that's going on in the office. It could be clinical cases. It could be how we manage a team during these really crazy years during COVID and stuff like that. Um, and that's like, I think, $900 for the year subscription for that. So very affordable um, and I think great value of hundreds of hours of video on being able to improve the quality of the dentistry you can do to, I think, improve your life and improve the quality of the lives of your patients and your team. 
Yeah, amen, brother. And if you're listening, I don't care if you're listening on Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, you can flip up to the notes and uh, our writers will put links to Dennis's platform in there. So I'm going to encourage you to check it out. And then also, Dennis, I've seen you do your stuff. You're an excellent, excellent teacher. And so if you've got a study club and you haven't had Dennis speak to your study club, my question is, why not? So Dennis, if I want to have you come out, how do I get a hold of you? Uh, reach me at Hartlieb, D-D-S, H-A-R-T-L-I-E-B, D-D-S, at D-O-T, hands-on.com. Awesome. I'm available for bar mitzvahs and weddings, too, Kirk, just so you know. <laughs> hey, I got to get you for a beer. I drive by, uh, you know, like, uh, and we got to get you down here. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll do that someday. I'm going to have you back. Is that all right? Thank you. I, that, I, I call it. that voluntolding. I like that. That's a term that I have. <laughs> I don't even ask you. You're just, you're just coming back. So uh, thanks for being here today, brother. I really appreciate it. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. If you enjoyed today which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends, put a review in there so that we can get to some of your friends and share the good news of best practices out there and things that you guys want to see, whether it be from Dennis. If you guys have questions about the Warren Dentition or other things, or even like simple things or complex things, Keep sending us suggestions. I'm going to line up an incredible lineup in 2022, and we'll keep bringing them to you because our goal here is to bring you things that make your practice and your life better at the Best Practices Show, and we're committed to that. So until we see you next time, hope you guys have a great day and enjoy a better practice and a better life. Thanks for listening. 